Good morning, everyone. It's really good to see you, and you're all most welcome here today. I greet you with the watchword for today is from Matthew 20, verse 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Think about that. The Son of Man, which is Jesus, the Creator, the Almighty God, did not come to be served, but to serve. And he set us an example with this. Um, we think of uh, Maundy Thursday that's coming up. And on Maundy Thursday, we always remember Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And he said, do the same. He did not come to be served, but to serve. And we are called to serve one another. Today we are going to celebrate communion. So I hope that you've all got your little communion kopiki, your little prepackaged elements. Um, hopefully we'll be moving away from those soon enough. But they are, we, that is what we will use today. And for the newcomers, you're also always welcome to come and join us. Um, just feel on the top, they've got this little see-through plastic thing. I mean, those of you who've been here every Sunday uh, know this already, but be careful not to pull the whole foil and everything out. It will be a bit dramatic. They're just the little foil, and it's fine. Then you've got the wafer, and then the, I mean, the little see-through plastic, and then the foil later. But don't worry. Um, if anybody makes a mistake, it's not a problem. It's fine. Right. The collection for today will be for the mission fund of our church, um, and that's when our whole church, they, they help congregations or new congregations form, they help pro and projects. Um, at the moment, we're looking at a project that supports early childhood development. That's one of the projects that we want to maybe support, um, a, a foundation phase or a teacher develop this course using items that people would have at home anyways in rural areas and there's a specific toys that they can make and they do this at the beginning of every year and then there's a curriculum that they follow and it's very easy and it's had a lot of success teaching basics uh, to children before they go into grade one so that's something that we are looking at and the money that we are collecting would also help sponsor those little toys that they want to make or the materials for that and for training of new teachers. So that's one of the projects that, we, that we'll support. This uh, coming Wednesday will be the last Lenten service, the sixth Lenten devotion, and that will be here in Wartburg. Then there will be a German Lenten devotion service, but then an online English one that will be sent out as we've been doing in the last month and a half. <coughs> And on the 10th, this coming Sunday, there'll be an English contemporary service here and an English traditional service in the church with communion. The rest of the services and what's happening over Easter, you can find on the announcement sheet. So if you want to come in the next month or so, grab one of these, put it on your fridge, and you can see exactly what's coming up and where. After the services, everyone is um, invited to a cup of tea or coffee at the hall just over here. And I see we've got three birthday people today, Tante Rosa Backerberg, Dieter Artmann, and Ryan Wichmann. And we wish them a happy birthday. Just a few notes on under general, if you're reading along. Tante Deuchen Steinhagen's funeral will take place today, after the services. And it will be in New Hanover at half past 11. Um, I've had a lot of questions, if people, even this morning, if people can come, you can come. Obviously, the church can only hold 80 people, but we're not doing the registration thing anymore. Um, but it's, so far, we've had quite a few people that are wanting, wanting to come and just support the family. We also congratulate Chris and Amy Bond um, on the birth of their son, Caleb. And it's very special. Caleb Zane. So if you remember Amy's brother, Court and V's son, they named a, their child after him. And we really congratulate Court and V. It's really a, a blessing. What a blessing. And then um, I, with my family, we will be pastors, Rolf and Jess. <laughs> I have to get used to that. It's lovely. We will be on leave next week. So from tomorrow, we'll be camping. I probably won't be reception, I hope. 
Uh, we'll be gone till the next Monday, and we'll be, I'll be back from Tuesday the 12th. And then I've been asked, there are posters, leaflets. This is a leaflet, not, obviously not a poster. And posters there with Trish. Just go like this, yeah. So if anybody wants to help us advertise for the New Hanover MTB and Trail, that's the mountain bike race and trail run in New Hanover. And we also have a bazaar that's on the 7th of May. Um, oh, this is the youth workshop, it's the wrong one. <laughs> but you can also advertise this one. <laughs> Um, please ask Trish and uh, she'll give you what she has there and advertise and share the word. If you see it on Facebook or on WhatsApp, just share it far and wide so that we have as many people with us on the day. That's the 7th of May. And then there's a youth workshop on the 7th of May. Mia, you're not going. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, I think that's it. The psalm reading for today is from Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O my God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God to guard my joy and my delight. I will praise you with a harp, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can trust in you and come to you. Thank you for psalms like this one that, that really express how many of us may feel. Downcast, mourning, feeling oppressed by everything that's going on around us in our lives and the people around us, Lord, perhaps we're overwhelmed with worry for loved ones, or for our work, or finances, or family. But Heavenly Father, we will keep our hope in you because you are our strength and joy. And we pray that you bring us to that mountain where you dwell. And we think, Lord Jesus, of Isaiah. We were so broken down, so afraid, so overwhelmed that you had to nurture him. Let him rest in the desert. And then when he had strength enough, you brought him to your mountain and you met him in that gentle breeze and you restored his soul. And we ask that today that you restore our souls, that we may meet with you. Lord, it's so easy that our hearts become cold and, and hard with all the things that we have to face or hurts that we have experienced. Or if we've just turned away from you so many times that we cannot trust ourselves. Bring us to your mountain. Open our hearts again. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing God's praise and his worship.
you are in this room. We have gathered in your name, God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, your name is above all names. And we open our hearts to you. Thank you for these amazing children. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift that they are. I pray that you help them not to be scared about anything, but that they want to know about you and learn about you, and that they can fall in love with you for the rest of their lives. This is any parent's biggest prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, young ladies and gentlemen, please follow Dani Anyama. There we go. Or not Danny, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we'll now hear the readings. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll be reading from Epistle Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9, and Gospel Mark. Uh, 10, 35 to 45. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to, one, for, to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Mark verses 10, 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. 
what you, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm, I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to him, to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard, it, heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over to them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The the reading. Thank you. I ask you to stand and let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the realm of the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for this next song. This is a song that I don't think we have sung before, um, and it's a song that I learned from Pastor Manfred Müller Nederbach. It's a confession song. My poor and tired heart doesn't know just where to start. And you'll see, concentrate on the words that as we sing it. If you don't know it, don't worry, just hear it and let it be a prayer. Um, you're well, obviously welcome to sing along. But if you concentrated on the readings, you would have realized that today is about putting to death one's self the great me to serve others. And that is a painful thing to do. And it's something that we have to fight against again and again because it's our human nature to serve our interests, what brings me a good reputation, what brings me a blessing. But Christ gave us an example where he poured out his life for us. And that's what this whole service is about coming back to God. And so let us sing this song of confession. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you also that you know our hearts. You don't whitewash things. Yes, Lord, in Jesus we receive forgiveness. But you tackle the things in our lives that aren't right. And Lord, so often we have allowed our faith to become empty words. We have often allowed the message of who you are and what you've done for us to, to stay here in our heads, Lord, and not reach our hearts. And yes, Lord, sometimes the struggles and hardships of life have made our hearts hard, even numb. Lord, bring us into your hands. Bring us back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share a sermon with you from our bishop that touches on a, on a question that is often on my heart as well and deals with this faith being here, but not really here, not lived out. And it's based on Hebrews 13, verse 12 to 14. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city. But we are looking for the city that is to come. Dear sisters and brothers, around 1660, a nobleman, Justinian von Welz, wanted to do donate 10,000 talers, which, which were large silver coins minted in the states and territories of the Holy Roman Empire. And he wanted to donate these 10,000 talers for the mission to the church. And at that time, there were too many pastors in Germany, and many of the theology students were unemployed after graduation or had to look for something else. A mission seminary was to be founded with this money, where these young people were to be trained and sent to the newly discovered continents. And the synod asked the leading Lutheran theologian, Ursinus for his an opinion, and he declared this idea to be a pipe dream, it's daydreaming, and it's cursed, and even ended his report with the words, Lord, protect us from that. The synod stated that mission is not the task of the church. Can you believe that? At least 30 years later, the Danish king sent two German pastors as missionary, missionaries to his Indian colony. Around 1700, in Halle in Germany, well, Halle in Germany became an important base for a revival around, around um, August, August Hermann Franke, where not only mission, but also diaconia, sort of acts of service, you know, feeding the hungry, these types of things, was discovered and promoted as the task of the church. And from here, many missionary movements throughout Germany emerged over the next 150 years, and we are a product of this. Today, about 5% of the population in Halle are Christians. 90% are atheists. They are not anti-God or anti-Christian. Anti-Christianity in the socialist era of the German Democratic Republic and German DDR of the East Germany, they were raised atheistically and have no relationship to God. How is it possible that in the country of the Reformation, 100 years after Luther's time, mission could be clearly rejected as a task of the church. And how is it possible that 200 years after the, a great revival that touched almost every country on earth, 90% of the population are atheists? Remember, this is Haas talking, and he says, When I was in Dessau, East Germany, in early March 2014, we also visited 
nearby Halle and the Franke Foundations, and I was very moved by this question of how it was possible for atheism to be so successful. There are churches everywhere, even if they were dilapidated after 40 years in the German Democratic Republic or were left as ruins after the war, they were still visible. They were there. How could it happen that the children and grandchildren of people who were baptized and confirmed before and during World War II did not know anything about God? At least there were some about 5% who remained Christians despite persecution and great disadvantage. But why only 5%? How could atheism be so extraordinarily successful? And I think I found at least one explanation for it. And the reason for the success begins long before 1939 to 1945. Germany had always been a religious country. When Irish missionaries came to, Ger to Ger the Germans before 800 after Christ, many of them were killed for teaching about a foreign religion. <coughs> Only uh, Boniface was successful after he cut down a sacred oak tree where the German, uh, Germans worshipped their gods. And when the gods didn't punish him, the Germans realized that there was a stronger god here. In the course of Christianization, however, not all Germanic tribes became Christians. Faith and politics had mixed, and large parts of Germany were Christianized with the sword. One could choose between baptism and death. And for most, baptism was the wiser choice. Germany was thus formally Christian, but the old religion and the old superstition lived on in the hearts of the people. The Reformation was not successful across the board either. For most princes, it was probably a decision of faith, the, the ones who had to stand up to the emperor, <coughs> a commitment to Christ. But the agreement, an agreement in Augsburg, decided that within the principality, their principality, all people had to have the same faith as the prince. So for many citizens, being Catholic, Lutheran, or Reformed was not a question of faith, but of geography, where you lived, and you had no choice. Even the priests had no choice. If the prince became Lutheran, they too had, be had to become Lutheran or leave the country. Even when an attempt was made to teach them what Lutherans believe, it often remained on the outside. Here. The liturgy and the structure of the services you could see felt, looked Lutheran, but people, it wasn't their heart. The people were religious, they believed in God, but not necessarily in salvation through Jesus Christ. It remained here and not here. In my opinion, this is exactly where the biggest problem of the Christian church lies to this day. Whenever I started a new confirmation course, I asked the question in the first hour, what or who is a Christian? And the most common two answers were someone who believes in God, and the other one is someone who keeps the commandments. Believe in God and keep the commandments. That is a Christian. No. A Christian is one who confesses with their whole hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. This is not only a problem for Germans, it's as old as the church. The letter to the Hebrews from which today's short sermon text comes bears witness to this. In this case, it is addressed to Christians from the Jewish tradition. Chapter after chapter is about showing what the difference is between Jews and Christians, even those in Christ. Christ gave himself for us so that sacrifices and rituals are no longer necessary for salvation. Christ is our mediator to God, so that priests and high priests are no longer necessary as mediators. Priests, pastors are not priests who administer salvation. You can't get salvation from me. We can only tell you about it. From the very beginning, Jesus himself and later the apostles had to struggle with the fact that people did not understand the core of the gospel, that God accepts us in Christ and calls us as redeemed people to follow him. 
Christ serves people so that they can see his salvation and love. We should also serve so that the love of Christ becomes visible. But again and again we think, believe in God and be decent. That means being a Christian. And, and this I see in us and our very congregation as well. And if decency doesn't work out, then we will say that we believe in God and in his forgiveness. Because the serving, suffering, redeeming Christ has faded out, crusades could be organized in the Middle Ages. They brutally murdered people of other faiths while singing hymns and psalms. That is why also in the Third Reich, with the consent and blessing of a large part of the church, war could be waged. God was with us was the watchword of the Third Reich. Jews could be persecuted and killed, the disabled killed, and those who thought differently were executed. When atheism took over in East Germany after 1945, Jesus was of little importance to many. And that is why one could, with great success, take God out of the saying, believe in God and be decent, and replace it with believe in myself and be decent. The atheists in East Germany are, for the most part, decent, honest, hardworking, orderly people. In South Africa... 75% of people call themselves Christians. And yet we have more violence, corruption, prejudice, and crime than most atheist countries. Can it be because we also have lost the core of Christianity, of the gospel? What is addressed in today's message, the readings? And this reading that this, from Hebrews, our text today, go out of the camp and bear his Christ's reproach. In other words, that we step out of our comfort zone, out of the areas where we feel comfortable or where we hide and confess Christ. That we become ministering followers of the ministering Christ. That in this country with prejudice, lies, and deceit, as Christians we reach out to each other and are the salt of the earth and light of the world in Jesus' name. Being a Christian does not mean believing in God and being decent, but living sanctified, belonging to him by Christ's blood as followers of Jesus in this world, knowing that we have no lasting city here, but that we are citizens in his kingdom. And if we forget this and don't teach this to our children, then atheism has an easy work ahead of its then we too will soon say about the mission like the church did in 1660. May the good Lord protect us from that. That's not our job. Then our descendants will also be godless. May the Lord protect us from this. May we keep proclaiming, confessing, professing our faith in Christ and not just receive in church or Bible studies, or our devotions. May we live it, even if it costs us. May we be like Christ, fight against hate and prejudice, corruption, and lies in his name. May we reach out to other Christians in his name and live out his salvation together in this world. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are guilty of letting our faith become words. Something just hidden in our own lives. It's it's my faith that I share in quiet. But we don't live it out. Lord, convict us. Lord Jesus, convict us where we have paid you lip service. Or cheapened your mercy and grace. By not holding you in awe. And fear. Deep respect. By just treating you as someone who just walks with us. As if our lives are the center of the universe. Instead of us following you. 
Convict us, Lord, where we have allowed the words of the gospel that you, Jesus, died on the cross for our sins, that you paid the price for us, that you rose again for us, and that our forgiveness cost you your whole life to become cheap. Speak your truth into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. This next song is a song of service. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Please, I invite you to stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we may come to you and know your name. Thank you for your patience with us. We love you, Lord. We love you because you love us. We love you because you died for us, Jesus. We love you because you prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And Lord, that prayer counts for us as well. We love you because you went to the broken and the downhearted and the outcasts, to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, and you spoke forgiveness. You went where no one else 
who believed in God and was decent, wanted to go. Oh Lord, we have often been decent, God-fearing Christians, well-dressed, saying and doing the right things. But we have not gone to the outcast and the broken. We have not gone to those that you would go to. We have stayed where it is comfortable. We have built up ourselves. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you speak your truth into our hearts. Lord, let our whole being be about you. Jesus, God, in, your, in the Bible, in your word, this number 40, 40 days of fasting or testing is just this, a burning away of self. Lord, over this Easter time, we ask that you let your hand be upon us, your truth, and burn away the chaff. Help us to serve one another, to visit the lonely, to carry one another, to bring hope to those who find none, to pray for one another. And to not be afraid of the brokenness of the world, but rather be defiant in confidence in you and in our love and fire for you to share your love and mercy to those who need it most. Teach us not to be afraid to get our hands dirty and to share your love with confidence because it is your power to save. More powerful than anything. You are the conqueror. You are the victor. You have won the victory. And there is no one who comes near you. And we get to share the news about you with others. With your authority. How amazing is that? Lord, we pray for our country. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you burn away all the chaff in our country. Lord, help us, Lord Jesus, as a country to burn away prejudice and anger, to be deliberate in what we do. Help us, Lord Jesus, to put away corruption, that you convict people that serve themselves and strengthen and elevate those who serve humbly. Lord Jesus, protect the marriages, not just in our congregation, but in this country, Lord Jesus. Soften hearts, help people to have compassion again for one another. Protect our children in this uncertain future. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those in war, yes, in Ukraine, but also everywhere else where there is war, that you be with them and help them bring peace, Lord Jesus. And Lord, bring revival in our hearts. And this, your body. In Jesus' name, amen. In preparation for communion, you may be seated. We're going to sing Agnus Dei.
Let us pray and I ask you to stand as we prepare for communion. It is truly fitting and right and for our lasting good that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, our Holy Father, almighty and eternal God through Jesus Christ our Lord, whom you have sent as Savior of this world, that through his death we may have forgiveness of sins and by his resurrection life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we adore and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. I ask you to hold up your communion packages. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the cup, he took, after the supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Take and drink from it, all of you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you. It is all prepared taste and see that the Lord is good. I ask you to take your wafer. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. In Ezekiel 11 verse 19 we hear this. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. May the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to everlasting life. In the peace of the Lord. Amen.
We're going to give thanks to God for what we've received, but I also want to share that uh, Uncle Vic Rankin Sr.'s brother quote, passed away uh, yesterday. Um, he lived down in the south coast. But we'll just keep them in prayer as well. Do you take? North Coast, sorry, thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift that you've received. And this communion, Lord Jesus, is a reminder again that we receive you, that we are one with you, a mystery that we cannot explain, just believe. Jesus, you said, this is my body and this is my blood, and we believe that. And yet it is so astounding to think that you gave yourself for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Help us to live free. Heavenly Father, we think today of the Rankin family who've uh, lost a brother and an uncle and Lord Jesus, a friend. Pray for all those who mourn that you carry them. We pray also for the Steinhagen family who will be um, laying to rest the ashes of Tante Dorchen today, that you grant them strength as well. We pray for Anton's recovery, Lord Jesus, that you give him strength. And everyone else who's struggling, we place into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. And now receive the blessing and the peace of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.